So hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Data Plus Diversity event. If this is your first time attending a Data Plus Diversity event, it is a monthly Tableau community series that provides a platform for community conversations surrounding the challenges and solutions to diversity in data. We're so glad you chose to spend your morning, your afternoon, and your evenings with us. For those of you who do not know who I am, I am Chantilly Jagannath. I'm the Vice President of BI and Data Analytics at Lovelytics based in Arlington, Virginia. I'm currently located in Lafayette, Louisiana right now though. I'm also the founder and CEO of the nonprofit organization Millennials in Data, where I work to bridge the data literacy and analytical skills gap by training, mentoring, and preparing millennials to enter a data-driven global environment. I'm also a five-year Tableau visionary and member of the Tableau Equity Task Force, and I'm excited to be your host today. A couple of quick reminders before we get started. Um, if you have to drop early, this session is being recorded and we will share it with everyone after today's event. You can submit questions for our live Q&A after today's presentation using the Q&A button in the chat. And please do continue to use the chat feature to engage and let us know exactly where you're located. I'm thrilled, super, super thrilled to have Dr. Talithia Williams with us today to share a bit about her journey and discuss how data is essential for understanding social determinants of health, like race, gender, income, and geography, and how we can take steps towards improvement by developing interventions and tracking progress over time. This isn't the first time that Dr. Williams has spoken to the Tableau community. Oh my goodness. No. I know. And I actually remember <laughs> from the Tableau conference um, in 2017 and 2019. Look at you, Chantilly, doing your research. Yes, <laughs> yes. So a warm welcome back. Um, a couple of things before I pass things off to you, Dr. Williams. Um, yes. She's an innovative, award-winning college professor and a co-host of the PBS Nova series, Nova Wonders, and a speaker whose popular TED Talk, Own Your Body's Data, extols the value of statistics in quantifying personal health information. She demystifies the mathematical process in amusing and insightful ways to excite students, parents, educators, and the larger community about STEM education and its possibilities. And with that, welcome Dr. Williams. Oh, Chantilly, thank you so much for having me. I am going to share my screen and um, good to see you all. I love the Tableau community. Uh, Chantilly is right. I got to, to share with you twice. And those were like some of the most fun conferences I have ever been to. So I'm really excited uh, to share a bit and talk a bit more about data and and uh, health disparities and am um, active in the chat because uh, we are going to have some chat time. So there'll be some questions that I'll ask you. And so uh, without further ado, let's go. Okay. Uh, I always love to start with just a little bit about me. So I am from Columbus, Georgia, which is actually where I am right now hanging out with my mom, spending some time with her. And um, I grew up just doing regular stuff. I was on the drill team. I was really active in my church community. Um, and while I've since become a statistician and a mathematician, that wasn't necessarily something I was exposed to at a young age. Uh, it was when I got to Spelman College, which is a historically Black college for women in Atlanta, that I first met Black women mathematicians. So here I am with the late Dr. Etta Faulkner, who was one of my professors at Spelman. She was one of the first women to get a PhD in math. And I think for me, Spelman really showed me that I could do anything. I could learn any subject. You know, all of the physics majors were Black women. All of the chemists were Black women. You know, all of the econ majors were Black women. And so really everything was available to me at this Black college because all the majors looked like me. So I didn't feel limited. I didn't feel afraid to go into a STEM discipline. I didn't feel afraid to tackle mathematics because it felt like there was a built-in community there. I started a PhD program at Howard University in theoretical math and love my time in DC. Shout out to those of you here from Baltimore and Maryland. Um, and I took a biostatistics elective at Howard University where I first got exposed to data. And it was in the biology department. I was really taking it because I thought it was easy and I would just get an easy A. And I ended up falling in love with data. We looked at a data set on women, um, women who smoked during pregnancy. 
And this was prior to there being any kind of legislation on nicotine and, and a woman's health. And so we were looking at this data set of women who either smoked or didn't during pregnancy and their baby's birth weight, the gestation, and you know whether there were lung complications or breathing complications. And I'm like, obviously, like everybody knows you shouldn't smoke during pregnancy. And so when we looked at this data, sure enough, you saw a discrepancy between women who smoked and didn't, and like the, you know, they had early, babies were born earlier, they were lighter birth weight, like all the things that we know. And so our professor said when this data set came out, uh, the, the tobacco industry was like, no, it's not smoking, it's not nicotine, it could be mother's ethnicity. We just don't really know what causes that. We can't correlate it to nicotine. And this wasn't an experiment, this is just observational data. And I remember just sitting up straight like, oh, how are you? Like, look at the data. It's obvious, look at the data. And so that was the moment where I decided to switch and transfer to finish my PhD in statistics. So I transferred to Rice University uh, to get a PhD in statistics. Here you see me with my advisor, Dr. Kathy Enzer, the day I graduated. And then this was just last year when I was in Houston and caught up with her again. Um, and some of the folks in my cohort and my family, my in-laws and my mom is down there. And our son, Josiah, who was a baby in that picture, who's now 15, that feels like yesterday. But so yeah, that was uh, really sort of what got me into data and really becoming a data scientist and a statistician. I also spent some summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory working in Lonnie Lane's lab. This was my first time really doing interdisciplinary research. So sort of taking my stats, math background and applying it with a team of people who were scientists and engineers. And we worked on the Europa Mission Project, which I'm happy to say is actually scheduled to launch in October of next year. So it's exciting to see something that I worked on so long ago finally come to fruition. And so that was really a fun introduction to what research was like as a mathematician. I also spent some time at the National Security Agency. I'd love to tell you what I did, but you know, you know, nobody wants to die today. So I'll just, uh, I'll say it was a lot of fun working at the NSA. And um, I accidentally took a document home once, like, you know, everything's top secret, so you can't take anything home. And there was paper that ended up in my personal belongings that I accidentally took home. I called it in, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got this paper. It's just, it was just like an article, but it, you know, you had to call it in. So I called it in. And the next day when I pulled up, they were like, oh, Timothy Williams. Yeah, if you can just drive over here. No, no, we need you to come over here. And so I had to like go through this whole security debrief. So, um, but it was a lot of fun working there. And uh, that's all I can say about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you're looking for me, my nine to five is in the math department at Harvey Mudd College. One thing that I love about our institution is that we really try to hire a diverse math faculty because we want our students to um, see that they have mathematical talent and to see that represented in the faculty. And so I'm excited to work with folks who not only love math, but just represent uh, the students, our students, and the ways that they can fall in love with math. So it's really great to be in that department. Um, as Chantilly mentioned, I've, I've done a lot of fun things. Uh, I have a TED Talk on owning your body's data. It talks about ways that we can use the data that we collect to make better health decisions in partnership with our doctors. And then I also got to author this book, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics, because it really highlights the journey of women mathematicians and scientists and statisticians who've come before us, who, uh, whose, whose stories I just didn't know growing up. And, you know, I'm so happy I ended up in math and in stats, but I wish I had have known of all these women who came before me, the, the Katherine Johnsons that I only learned about when I went to see the movie, hidden figures. And I'm like, I worked at NASA. Why did I not know about Katherine Johnson? If anybody should have known, I should have known about her before. And so I wanted to write this book to really capture the lives of those amazing women who've come before us and to share their stories with the girls who are coming behind us. Um, after the TED Talk came out, folks at PBS reached out about the idea to do a show called Noble Wonders. And I was just like, why in the world? You know, I thought it was a spam email, quite frankly, uh, when I first clicked on it. Um, but I got to co-host this amazing series on some of the biggest questions in science. And 
probably what, you know, what you all will, will really appreciate is that what underlies each of these six episodes, you know, what are animals saying? What's living in you? Can we build a brain? What's the universe made of? Uh, is data, is data at the frontier of all of these questions, the way that we answer them is often through collecting and analyzing and understanding data and visualizing data. So it was really great as a statistician to be able to talk about that, how our area shows up in all of these fields, how data is so important to advancement in science. More recently, I hosted a, a show, Zero to Infinity on PBS, which talks about numbers, the origin of them and how they came about, but in a really fun way that engages the public. So I brought a clip to share with you today. Zero and infinity, mind-bending ideas. Discover how these concepts revolutionized mathematics. The simplest ideas end up the most influential, the most profound. Whoa! It's the story of nothing. Who knew you could learn so much from pizza? <laughs> and everything. It's all one big principle. Zero to infinity on Nova. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, that's a really fun show to watch. Um, Okay, um, now hopefully you're warmed up. I want to dig into some strategies for eliminating health disparities. Um, as a mathematician, you know, before we talk about something, we've got to define it. And so um, the first question is sort of what is health equity? When we think about health equity, you know, what does that mean? What is, how, do we, how do we define it? What's our working definition going to be? And so I'm going to use the one that the CDC uses, which is when everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. So when we think about health equity, we really think about equality in terms of health. And so then that leads us to health disparities. When you think about health disparities, what are they? Well, those are really differences in health outcomes and their causes among different groups of people. Right? And so our goal as a society is to really reach for health equity um, so that everyone benefits, everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy lifestyle. The formal definition that the CDC uses is that health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations, right? So your turn. Uh, what are some of the common causes of health disparities? So in the chat, I want to hear from you. What do you think causes health disparities? You'll notice that causes is in quotation marks, right? Because we don't know exactly what causes health disparities, but what are some things that you think lead to health disparities? Yes, racism, lack of education, employment, access to healthy food, bias, pollution. Y'all, I love y'all. Oh my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. All of these are great. Yes, ageism, food deserts, geographic location. Oh my goodness. Classism, perfect. Health literacy. Yes, yes, yes. These are all great. Here are some that come to mind when I think about health disparities. Uh, poverty, environmental factors. Someone mentioned access to health care educational inequalities, right? All of these are um, possible causes for health disparities. Let's look at some of the numbers. When we look at the social determinants of health, 20% of the health outcomes, of our health outcomes are directly attributed to the type of care we get. So going in, seeing your doctor for a checkup, going to the hospital, right? 20% of our health outcomes are, can be attributed to those treatments. The other 80% is really tied to social and economic factors or the physical environment or people's health behaviors, some of which is really beyond folks' control. Uh, notice that 85% of physicians report that unmet social needs lead to poor health outcomes. And 20% of physicians are confident in their ability to address unmet social needs. So that means 80% of them are not confident in their ability to address people's unmet social needs, okay? And so this is the topic that we wanna sort of dig into. Why is it that we see that health disparity? 
and where does it show up? It often shows up, I know you'll appreciate this graphic on the right, uh, for rural patients in particular, patients who maybe don't have the financial means to pay for services or aren't able to take time off to go in for a checkup or routine visits. Um, also, uh, patients who don't have confidence in communicating with their healthcare providers, maybe they have poor health literacy, and so they're not able to articulate, you know, what uh, their, their, what aches them or what their pains are. Um, also, lack of trust, and can they use these services without compromising their privacy, right? If I've got immigrant families who might be scared about being deported, right? they may also be scared about going in when they're having health complications, or groups that just believe that they are, they won't they're not going to get quality care, right? So I'm not going to go because I'm not I know that I'm not going to get quality care. Okay, so data pop quiz: some of the leading causes of death by race and ethnicity. This is the data that we are going to look at. What do you think are some of the top leading causes of death? Drop that in the chat. What do you think the leading causes of death? Maybe for men and women, if you want to aggregate it. You can also aggregate by race if you have ideas about that. What do you think some of the leading causes of death are? Perhaps by race and ethnicity. Ooh, pregnancy. Ooh, I want to hear more about that. Is that pregnancy for everybody? Pregnancy for a certain, yes. Heart disease, cancer, violence. Yes, Lee. Mm -hmm. Cardiovascular disease. All right, April. Yep, pregnancy issues for Black women, Mackenzie. Spot on. Yes, other ideas, stress, absolutely. And stress actually shows up in a lot of those, right? Yes, that you're right. India, that's a, um, Indra, sorry. Indra, that's such a great point after Roe v. Wade being overturned that uh, death due to pregnancy is going to spread to other uh, races as well. Yep, cancer for Hispanics, access to health insurance, absolutely. Y'all are on it. Y'all had some, some coffee, some caffeine this morning. Yes, not seeing urgency in treating patients based on stigma. Absolutely. Right. We see that when you look at different, um, different healthcare prediction models that are inequitable, even when they don't include race. Right. So yes, we see that. Let's dig into this data. Yes, bias and pain thresholds, right? Believing that certain groups can withstand, withstand a certain amount of pain over others. Great. Let me give you a chance. There's a lot of information on this slide. This is the leading causes of death by race and ethnicity for women from 2018. Those numbers haven't shifted very much. drop in the chat if you some things that you notice. I'll just call out a couple of things that I am noticing. So for non-Hispanic white women and non-Hispanic black women, the leading cause, heart disease and cancer. For Asians and uh, Alaskan natives, notice how that flips, right? And also non-Hispanic uh, Pacific Islanders, their number one is cancer followed by heart disease. Interesting that unintentional injury shows up for American Indian and, and Alaska Native at 8.2%. Alzheimer's disease shows up in many of these groups as well. Diabetes for black women, for Asian women. So it's always interesting to sort of look at how that, uh, how death varies for women by race. Here's that same data for men. Just give you a chance to look over that. Yeah, Mary, I don't see that, that data aggregated by specific cancers. That's a great question. I'm sure for women, it might be uh, breast cancer might be higher on that list, but yeah, that's a great question. Yep, great question, April. Yeah, it would be interesting to see that breakdown. Yes, Liz, unintentional injuries, what is that? 
Um, I don't think that's gun violence because there is a column for homicide here. Um, I, yeah, I think unintentional might be like, maybe, maybe accidental gun violence. Uh, yeah, falling off a ladder, getting attacked by a bear, car crashes. I don't know, maybe some of the guys can, like, yeah, lawnmower accidents. Guys, what are you doing? Because this doesn't show up for the women. So yeah, non-Hispanic, so white men at, at almost 7% are dying from unintentional injuries. The other thing that's interesting to notice, because often uh, when, when we think about communities that are disproportionately affected um, in terms of health inequities, we often don't think about what those communities might bring to the table. So for instance, notice that you see suicide showing up as number eight for white men, right? Number eight for Asian. It also shows up here for Alaska Native. It shows up for non-Hispanic uh, Hawaiian Pacific Islander. It shows up also for Hispanic. Black men are the only column that don't that su where suicide is not in the top 10 causes of their death. So that's interesting to think about what is it in the black community that keeps men from killing themselves. Now you'll notice that homicide also shows up many places, right? Hispanic, um, that's in most of the columns. It also shows up as number five among black men. And so it's interesting to sort of see where these things fall within communities as well. Let's talk about how we might create a data, a, a culture of data agency to really start to eliminate some of these health disparities that we see in the data. And so three points that I wanna to leave to you in the time that we have. The first is to uh, appreciate the data. So how do we mindfully collect it, understand it and evaluate it? Many of us were uh, inundated with data from COVID-19. Johns Hopkins has a beautiful dashboard where you could really just dig into the specifics of the data by county, by city, by state, by country. Um, and so it was really the first time where people also were very public in sharing their data, right? Sharing that they got vaccinated, sharing um, their health outcomes very openly. And in fact, the National Academy of Medicine came up with an article on uh, health data sharing and um, they said this, the effective use of data is foundational to the concept of a learning health system, one that leverages and shares data to learn from every patient experience and feeds the results back to clinicians, patients, family and healthcare executives to transform health and health equity. The American healthcare system is in a position to harness new technology and new data sources to improve individual and population health. So when I think about what is gonna really transform health equity for our country, it really is how do we share this data in a way where people feel like their privacy is also maintained, but how do we then use that to improve the overall individual and population health? When you also look at the COVID-19 impact, you notice that it was really disproportionate on minorities, uh, racial and ethnic minorities in particular in the US, but uh, throughout the world. And so, so many articles were published that talked about this need for a trauma-informed social justice response, not just for COVID-19, but when we think about diseases that might impact us globally in the future, how can we take lessons learned from this uh, so that communities don't have desperate impact as well? And a lot of that stems back to our, our past history um, how many of you know about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? In the chat, have you heard of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment? I learned a, a little bit about it growing up. Yes, yes, I love all these yeses. Yes, <laughs> like, yes, of course. Angela, you'd be surprised. Many of my students have not heard of it. And so I have to take the time to really educate them on it. Um, I'd heard a little bit about it myself growing up in Georgia, uh, not far from Tuskegee, about maybe an hour away from Tuskegee. But my mom was alive during that time and remembered it very well. And I remember when the vaccine came out, when it was first available for older Americans. And I was like, mom, let me schedule your appointment. And she was like, well, I don't know. I remember what happened in Tuskegee. So it really forced me to go back and read up on it because 
you know, her experience with the government treating members of the Black community was really very negative. And, you know, having known people who went through this. So for those of you who may not know, in 1933, this uh, experiment began on 600 Black men in Tuskegee. 399 of them had syphilis, 201 of them did not. But there was no type of um, informed consent that was given. It, it wasn't obvious what they were doing. They were told that they were gonna get treated for bad blood. Um, but they were really trying to study, the US was studying how does syphilis progress in the body untreated. 11 years after the study began in 1943, penicillin came out as a treatment of choice, but it wasn't given to the men who were in this experiment. And it wasn't until 1972 all right, so do the math from, 19, from 1932 to 1972. So 40 years later that the Associated Press broke this story that the study was happening. These men were being, were, you know, were being examined with syphilis and not being treated. And that was only, it was only then that the story ended, but the study ended and a class action lawsuit came out um, on behalf of those participants. In 1997, former President Bill Clinton issued a formal apology for it. And it wasn't until you know, the 2000s, 2004, that the last study participant died, 2009, that the last widow died, and there are still children who are receiving, of course, medical and health benefits. And so for many people in the Black community, there was a hesitancy to embrace the COVID-19 uh, vaccine because of this history of, of how the community had been treated in the past. And so that really had to come into play. We really had to talk about that in the black community and talk about how this situation was different. One thing that we did in the community was highlight the work of Dr. Kizmikia Corbett, who's a UMBC alumna uh, and her work in developing the vaccine with the NIH. And so here you see her with President Biden and former President Trump. And I love her quote that she shares here that diversity matters for health outcomes for everyone because if we're all gonna need the vaccines, we all have to work towards them. And so really the way that we start to bridge some of these gaps is by inviting everyone to the table, inviting them to the table of discovery so that we're all a part of the process. Um, number two is to aggregate, how do we build partnerships that transform communities? And so when I think about empowering patients, so it's not just one directional, like what can I do for patients, but really what is it that we can do to empower them so that they can walk into their doctor's office and take control, right? And say, here's what I, here's the data that I have, here's the information that I have, and to share that confidently um, with their doctor. So when I think about empowering patients, I think of two things, giving them authority or power to take ownership of their health experience, and then becoming stronger and more confident in controlling their life and claiming their own rights, especially when it comes to their health and their health outcomes. Um, my father-in-law lived with us uh, the last two years of his life before he passed away and he got really sick and uh, we were taking care of him in the hospital. There's a picture of me trying to feed him and he was just, you know, not eating and I was, you know, my facial expression was just like, dad, if you don't put this in your mouth, like I am over this. Um, and, uh, and, and I'd even brought him some cake. Look at that little plate on the side. It's got like some chocolate cake in it and, you know, stuff that he really didn't need to have. But um, I was like, okay, dad, you're 84. You've lived this long. Just, you know, if, if you, if, if you'll eat cake, just eat cake, like if it'll help you to eat. Well, uh, one day, um, the doctor who was doing rounds was just happened to be a, a young black doctor. And this wasn't his doctor. He was just, you know, he was, it was his day to do rounds and he came in and he sees dad and he starts talking about, oh, you're from Dallas. Oh, how about those cowboys? And, you know, and dad's just lit up. Right. And he's like, well, Mr. Williams, you know, you're, you're still in good shape, but you really got to change your eating. You know, you got to cut out you know, all you need more fruits and vegetables and you need to eat healthy. And, you know, I don't want to see you all eating all this pork and this meat and, and dad lights up. And so then the guy, he goes to the next room. Thank you, Dr. So-and-so. And dad's like, I want you guys to get me fruits and vegetables. I want to eat healthy. And I want you to bring me smoothies. And I was like, smoothies? <laughs> like your doctor has been telling you for 30 years, the set, like exactly what this young black guy just told you 
verbatim. But all of a sudden he heard it differently from this young black doctor. And he had us bringing him smoothies <laughs> every day because this doctor said, I gotta eat healthy. And it was so wonderful because actually it, it helped to heal him. We ended up, you know, he ended up getting out of the hospital. We took him to Legoland. Like it, I think it really did extend his life because he just had a new outlook on like, oh, I can eat healthy. I can be healthy. And it came from uh, identifying with this doctor, right? And, and so it's so important too that we also have a diverse um, healthcare team because trust me, his doctors have given him the same data, the same information, but somehow he received it so differently when his doctor walked in and identified with him, talked about the Cowboys and said, I need you to eat healthy. And from that day on, he was just really committed. He was on about 13 medications. He came down to two. And this is at 84, like this is, this is like the latter years of his life. He passed away at 86. And so it was just really such a testament to the importance of having uh, diversity um, in our healthcare team. Um, the wearable revolution is, is personal. And so what we're noticing is that now we're able to collect data in so many different ways, right? We've got uh, articles of clothing, we've got our watches, our glasses, just, um, shoes. There's so many innovative things that are coming out that are allowing people to collect data about themselves, that are allowing people to also have preventative care. The newest Apple Watch starts to warn you if it notices that your heart rate is starting to jump to levels and you might be having a heart attack, right? It'll actually alert someone and call someone if it senses that you've had a heart attack. And so this data is available. We're really shifting patterns of how we utilize data in our daily lives and in our social interactions. For us, the way that we are really starting to incorporate data to have better health decisions is through competition. So we actually track our data. So this is my family and I, where we uh, compete to see who gets the most steps in a week. And so I'm sure I came back and won this week, even though I'm in number two in this data set. Um, but it was showing, this app shows us like, you know, are you walking every hour? Are you standing every hour? What's your movement look like? Notice on Sundays, I have the least amount of steps. But it also uh, allowed us to compete with our kids and compete with our friends to make sure that we're constantly moving. Of course, there are apps that will chart things like your cycle. So ladies, if you're still on a have, a have a cycle, there are apps where you can keep that data and have access to that data. I personally, I enjoy working out. Yvette's on here. She's also one of my Peloton buddies. So she knows that, you know, we get on and get on the Peloton. And I used to just get on and work out like exercise and I'm done. And, you know, I enjoy seeing my heart rate. So here you see I'm in the yellow zone, which is like 80% of my heart rate. And then the blue, the green and blue zone are lower heart rate levels. And so I used to not think anything about this data. I used to just like seeing that, yeah, I had a good workout. Um, but I was reading about high intensity interval based training, right, for heart health and how when we do these types of workouts, it actually benefits us cardiovascular. And it made me think, I wonder if I can do HIIT training and not only that, how it might show up in my data. So I started finding workouts that did HIIT training and I wanted to try to test my heart rate to see if I could actually see it in the data and um, notice what you see here. So here is a day where I first tried out HIIT training and you'll notice that I'm sort of peaking and declining, peaking and declining. And then I thought, I wonder if I could do like even more. So here was another day where I tried a more intense HIIT training session. So I was going all the way up and then trying to drop back down. And so for me, it was great to be able to uh, take this idea of HIIT training and see it in my actual uh, heart rate data as I was doing those workouts. Lastly, number three, before we finish with questions is to lead with passion and purpose. One of my passions has always been how do we train the next generation of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, data scientists, statisticians to really um, be conscious about what they can contribute to society, especially in STEM fields. And for girls of color, I'm especially excited about introducing them to STEM, getting them excited about it. And at Harvey Mudd, I have done a conference for girls of color for the past, gosh, 14 years where we bring them to our campus and just share with 
in STEM, and it really allowed them to see themselves in the discipline. Uh, we were written up recently in Forbes magazine about the work that we do for girls. And I love just inviting them into this space so that they can learn from other women who are uh, scientists and engineers and mathematicians, but also they can ask their questions and um, what they're afraid of or, or what, um, you know, what their experience has been and share that in a safe space and get their questions answered. The first year that we did the conference, we had parents come, many of the parents who had never been to our campus or been to the Claremont Colleges before. And we were like, okay, thank you for giving us your daughter. We're gonna love on her and do great sessions and we'll see you at three o'clock. <laughs> and these parents, they did not leave. They were like, I am not leaving my baby girl on this college campus. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen. And so they just hung around and I was like, okay. So from that, we started doing a parent workshop. So we started inviting our parents to stay and to meet with uh, counselors from the local Claremont uh, College District and high school counselors and, and giving them resources and tools so that they can help their daughters and their sons to be successful. I love this quote from one of our moms. She said she most enjoyed seeing excitement and wonder in each young woman as they sat at the footstools of women who were practicing and actualizing their dreams. And then um, I also love sort of the, the impact that I get to have on people who have, um, have, have, have been impacted by the work that I've done. And so recently I had a young lady um, reach out to me and, and, you know, just, just, you know, I love seeing you on, on TV, Talithia. I really resonate with you. And I love that my kids get to see someone who looks like them, who does mathematics. That's really exciting. One of the emails that I got was from Jeff. He says, I just wanted to let you know how much I enjoyed your PBS program on zero and infinity. I'm not a mathematician, but as a fellow professor, I was curious as to how one could present something somewhat mundane, zero, and something abstract, infinity, in an interesting way. And I feel that you are a smashing success. I got this sweet email from Sarah. She says, hello, I'm the mother of a five-year-old boy with autism. His special interest happens to be numbers and the history of numbers. And we came across Zero to Infinity on PBS. He's watched it about 20 times this week. And he begged me to tell you that he liked you very much and that it must be very fun to have a job where you can be surrounded by so many numbers. Wishing you a very Merry Christmas. Best regards from Max in Sweden. So I'm often touched by um, how many people are impacted by this work and not just the math, but also sort of seeing themselves in the work. A young lady uh, reached out, uh, Zoe, and she said, I want to I want to be you. I'm going to dress up for you as Black History Month for Black History Month. And so I did this interview with Zoe and um, her mom sent me this where she was, you know, because I was just like, Zoe, girl, what are you going to wear? Like, I don't have an outfit. I don't have a uniform. She's like, it's I've already picked it out. I've already picked it out. I'm going to do a poster. It's going to be so great. And so she did her little poster. And it was so cute. Um, when she first reached out, I was like, Zoe, you can't be me, honey. I'm not old enough to be uh-uh, not for Black History Month. You gotta, it's gotta be like Coretta Scott or Rosa Parks or Katherine Johnson. You know, I was just like, you know, I have not, I have not earned my way to Black History Month status. Uh, but this was so sweet. So I was so excited to see um, her be inspired by the work that I've done. And, and she nailed that. She really did nail that. So lastly, the three strategies that we sort of talked about today is how we might mindfully collect and understand and evaluate data, keeping in mind the people that the data are coming from, how we can aggregate, build partnerships that transform communities and also illuminate by leading with passion and purpose. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take your questions in the time that we have left. Such an amazing uh, presentation, and, and thank you just so much for sh for sharing your story. Um, you definitely captivated my attention at the beginning when you talked about um, that data set at Howard University, because um, I attended Howard University as well, and um, my passion for data started um, at Howard, and that's how I was able to really start my career in Tableau and in data in general. So 
I appreciate that. And I could really resonate with you on that. And then in the end where you talked about illuminating and reaching back, you know, um, the picture that you had of all those young girls with you at that, that conference, like that just spoke volume uh, to the work that you're doing and the impact that you're having. So I really appreciate, you know, the presentation that you, you walked through. Thank you. Thanks. I see two questions already. Yeah. Um, yes. Thoughts on tracking menstrual cycles and fears people have of it being used against them. That's a great question. Um, I, you know, I would. So uh, from reading on how Apple tracks it. So if you have uh, Apple products or an Apple watch or the built in Apple health app. Um, I think that data is definitely private and maintained. So if you track it, maybe in that type of an app, like no one can access it you know, um, and it's safe. I have concerns about other apps that you download that you use, you know, Clue, there are certain ones that I use, but, you know, I'm sort of getting to where I'm beyond that, that age anyway. But uh, those are places where I'm not quite as sure, like who has access to that data. Um, I would want to research that if I were in that position and I, and I were concerned. I started out just doing it on pencil and paper, like old school, here's a chart with temperatures and I would actually chart my data. So I think if I was concerned to the point where um, I really didn't want anyone to know, then if you you know Google um, menstrual charts, you can actually print out charts that allow you to just calc take that data manually and, and look at it manually. So the app just does that for you. It makes it easier, but you could totally just do it on your own. Yeah. Um, ooh, let's see. How do we help people of color overcome imposter syndrome, the fear of getting uh, in the data and the analytics field because it's never been offered as an option for us to pursue. Where does one start to learn and bring that knowledge back to our communities of color, especially the youth who are often portrayed as not smart enough for the STEM and other tech fields? Great question. So that was really why I started this conference for girls of color, because I wanted them to be able to see themselves as data scientists, as engineers, and, if, and just see it as an option for them, right? It, that it's available. Should you go and be an English major and a Pulitzer Prize winning writer? That's great. But then you know you could have done that and you could have done whatever you wanted to. Um, I think sharing our stories of overcoming, I, I have a whole talk that I give on imposter syndrome. I have a talk that I give on my failures. And so just making it commonplace that we often have these feelings um, I have white male students that also feel imposter syndrome. So giving them spaces to share when they feel like they're also unqualified or not qualified or don't deserve to be in a space. I think the more that we share and talk about it, the more people understand that they're not the only one who's had that experience. Thanks for that, Edwin. Oh, how do we approach and promote professionals from underrepresented communities to have a positive impact beyond visual representation, especially when the education on trainings needed are based in systemic racism and promote racial ethnic bias? I think we have to elevate people within our organization. And so I think that our leadership needs to be representative of the community because that's not just a visual, but it's also someone who has the power to make transformative change. Um, many of the math departments around the country don't look like our faculty, and that's okay. But I think when you can start to have a diverse looking faculty, then, then you don't have to say we're welcoming and we're inclusive because students look at us and say, obviously, you've got faculty genders and ethnicities and races. So I think as we start to have our leadership represent the diversity that we say we're committed to, that can have a, a, an impact. But that also gives people power to make better decisions. Yeah. Ooh, these are so good. Okay, uh, what would you recommend, where would you recommend starting in hospitals, organizations that are still in our infancy on the data journey? I'd love to acknowledge disparities at the forefront and not an afterthought. Mm. I think we have to be intentional in, in the things that we know are inequitable. So for example, one of you mentioned black women mortality rates um, uh, in, in giving birth. So I think that would be an area where as an hospital or an organization, I might say, whenever a black woman comes, you know, I'm gonna, I want to have an extra nurse that's assigned specifically to her. You know, I wanna make sure that we're attentive to her pain levels, her needs. You know, I, I want black women to stay an extra two days 
just so that we can make sure that they, that every, you know, I mean, just, I mean, I think that policy, I can see pushback, but I can also see the fact that it doesn't make sense that their mortality rate is higher outside of racism, right? And so the way that you combat it is you address it specifically, right? You say, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Whenever a black woman comes in, here's our policy for making sure that they are not gonna die in our care because we know that we have biases, that we all bring these biases to the table. I don't think nurses are out there, how do we take black women out? But I really do think it's, it's just a bias that people have that shows up in their job. And so the way that you overcome that is by being intentional for the disparities that you already know exist in health. Um, the same for you know, the way that we assign care you know, when, when whites or Asians come in and, and they present with the same illnesses as, as Blacks and Hispanics, they get a higher level of care. They get more scans done than you than are offered to other communities. And so the way that you combat that is just saying, okay, if, if this is what we, if this is the standard that we offer, then this is the standard that everyone gets, you know? And so I think we have to be intentional. Oh, what are your thoughts on chat GPT being inclusive with data gathering? Yeah, I think chat GPT is like asking white men questions, asking smart white men questions. Um, nothing's wrong with that, but I don't think that it's representative of the thoughts of the entire community and of different cultures. So, um, and this is being recorded. Oh, Lord, Chantilly, we're gonna have to cut that out. And like she said, but it is, right? If you just, if you look at who's building the algorithms, it's it's smart white men. And so the answer that you're gonna get is the answer that a smart white man would, would give you. And sometimes that's great and sometimes it's not. And so, um, yeah, I think we have to think about that in, in you know, I'll leave it there. We just have to mm -hmm. think about that. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. It is biased. You're right, April. Emily. We could have an entire Nelson session. Nelson Mandela on said, if, on bias and AI. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. Oh, yes, anonymous attendee. How do we change the existing narratives that exist about health outcomes in communities of color that we speak the language of our communities? Mm. I, I, it's, that's interesting. You know, I think within our community, oh, I'll just speak within the Black community. I think we, we understand that, that, that we are prone to hypertension, diabetes, and in some ways we joke about it. Like I go to the family picnic and I get a cup of sweet tea and I know it's diabetes in a cup. Like we're like, oh, give me that diabetes in a cup. Like we literally laugh about the fact that we we know we're drinking too much sugar, right? Um, and so I think it's I think it's there. I think the challenge is that we need health professionals who look like us and who relate to us, who can resonate with. Okay, I know on Fourth of July you're gonna drink, or I'm sorry, I know on Juneteenth y'all are gonna have your diabetes in a cup, but. How do we limit that to holidays, right, right? How do we cut back on sugar? How do we celebrate, but then how do we also maybe Monday through Friday keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a healthier diet? How do we cook healthy collard greens? How do we cook? And so I think it takes someone who's in the community to say, I respect your community culture, your food traditions. I know that that's a part of what brings you together. Let me help you bring come together in a healthier way, right? Change this one thing at Thanksgiving. Change this one recipe. I know that was great grandma's peach cobbler recipe, but let's do vegan butter as opposed, like let's just see what it tastes like with vegan butter, right? You know, and so I think I think there are ways to come into the community and respect the existing narrative while also saying it's important that we make shifts. Um, how do we just do more movement? You know, how do we walk? Incorporate a walk in the family picnic. You know, incorporate some game that everyone gets to play, so that we start to move and exercise. I think there are things that we can do to, to you know, just to not feel like it's like don't do this, don't eat this, stop. You know, cut out your salt, cut out your sugar, because nobody's going to do that, and then we're going to have these same disparities. Okay, 
I'm thoughtful about time. So Chantilly, you tell me, I can keep going. I think we have time for the, the last one that someone um, just put in, the very last one. Okay, is that five? Priya? Yes, mm -hmm. given the recent SCOTUS ruling on affirmative action. Ooh. Do you think we're gonna see changes in how underrepresented youth are encouraged to enter these programs? Oh, Priya. Mm -mm -mm. Um, California is a good example because affirmative action uh, was um, done away with some years ago in our state. Maybe it was 1997, I don't remember exactly. And the numbers of, of black and brown students fell drastically. And only recently has it sort of come back up to those uh, to those previous levels. Yes, Katie, they can if it's in essays. So I think what, what many colleges in California have had to do is create those programs, bridge programs that are specifically targeting communities, targeting high schools um, in certain areas and recruiting students from those diverse high schools uh, through pipeline programs. So they've just had to be really intentional in recruiting students. Um, I, I, I do think that we're also going to see changes because a lot of the black and brown students that then get accepted to these places, very few or fewer. And so from some of the students that I've spoke to who like, who went to Berkeley around the time where, um, where affirmative action was disallowed in California, they sort of felt like there wasn't even enough students to have a black community. Like, I don't wanna to come to a space where I am the only or very few of. Um, and so I think you're also gonna see a pullback from students wanting to then go and be the sole representative in different spaces. Um, and so I think the onus is really oftentimes on us to make sure that we're encouraging people, folks around us, folks in our, you know, in, in our periphery to consider data science, consider statistics, consider STEM. That's really part of my work. And I don't get paid by Harvey Mudd to do that. You know, I'm really paid to be a professor, but I can't not, I can't be a professor and not bring more women of color into my field, right? Because I feel like the onus is still on me to change the narrative around black women or, you know, women of color in statistics and in data science. And so with every breath I have, I'm gonna be like, you should be a statistician. You need to do data science. Oh my gosh, have you heard of Tableau? It's amazing, right? So um, I feel like it's also partly our responsibility to, to sort of take that to the masses and the people who exist around us so that we can also be intentional in encouraging folks to come into the field. Awesome. Well, I have the final question to ask. Um, after today's session, how best can the audience connect with you? Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram. I'm, you can find me at Harvey Mudd. My email address is there if you wanna send an email. I wish I could say I have a person who gets that, but it goes straight to me. So yeah, <laughs> LinkedIn, Instagram, or just email. I'm also on Facebook, but you know. I don't know y'all like that yet. So we got to get to know each other before you, before you get to see that, that data, <laughs> those pictures. <laughs> like what? She was in Jamaica? Oh my goodness. Yeah, we got to be, we got to be friends before you see those. But yeah. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> But thank you so much, uh, Dr. Williams, for your time today. Thank you for sharing your, your knowledge your expertise, and your experience. Um, thank you to the audience for engaging and asking some really great questions. Uh, I hope you all were inspired just as much as I was. And I hope you learn ways about data and analytics and how it can be used to create a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable future. Yes. We'll be uh, sure to share all the links and the resources mentioned, as well as the recording and our follow-up email. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or your evening, and we hope you attend our next event. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. Williams. Oh, I loved it. Thank you all. Thanks for your great interaction, too. You made it so fun. Awesome. I hope y'all enjoy your day. In my mom's day. In Georgia. Good old Georgia. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Bye, everyone.